I love that. There's a yes in all of us. And uh, today we're talking about discipleship, uh, kind of going through discipleship for the whole year. Um, actually, it's probably going to be the rest of our lives, really, if you think about it. Um, we don't move away from discipleship, but we are focusing in on Matthew this year. We're going through the book of Matthew, and we believe that uh, God has called each one of us to be disciples and to make disciples. And uh, we need to know then who it is that we're following, because a disciple is a follower, a disciple is a learner, a student, an apprentice, and we are following the Lord Jesus Christ, and so we need to know who it is we're following, and that's why we're going through this gospel. It's good to be back. I've been out for a few weeks. Uh, I was in Vietnam, and God is doing some great things in Vietnam. Um, We, uh, myself and Pastor Wayne and Rita, we were there, and there's this vision that we have. And I don't know if you can believe this, but the vision is, is that we would see Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos reached for Jesus. The nation, those three nations, especially Indochina, reached. Um, and while we're there, um, the, there began to be some discussions about how it might even expand from there. That's huge. We're starting these things called seed centers. And a seed center is simply us going there, as crazy it is, <clears throat> us going there and um, training these pastors who will plant churches, and then they will then create a seed center where they will train maybe three to five other uh, church planters, and then uh, they, will, they will start churches, and then those folks will start their seed centers, train a few more, and then those people will start churches and so on and so forth. Also, the, the people that are gathering together these, these seed centers, they will continue to meet on a monthly basis to support, encourage, and collaborate together in how they could partner in the kingdom work. Because we feel like there's a unity that's necessary to see uh, God's kingdom grow. God loves it when uh, brothers and sisters dwell together in unity. And so we're just part of this thing. It's just getting off the ground. Um, there's four modules that are going to be taught this year. Pastor Wayne and myself, we're doing two of the modules. So we'll be going back in October. And then our, our ministry partner, Joshua, he is there. He's doing modules one and three. Wayne and I and Rita did two and four. And so it's a one-year prog- uh, program that we're doing. This goes way beyond things that we could ever hope for and imagine. And uh, we're just excited to, to be a part of what God is doing. Uh, you guys are a part of what God is doing. You guys send us. You guys pray for us. And just like Jana says, we have a church in Tokyo. We have a ministry in Indochina. We all do. And, and that's an amazing thing. So God is working in, in, in great ways. And we're just going to be taking a, a look at a passage today that's going to move the ball forward, I believe, in our understanding of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. What does that mean to be a follower of Jesus? And so this passage that I'm going to go through today, it's found in Matthew chapter 8. And there's really three distinct sections of this, of this passage, uh, of these, uh, this section of Scripture that uh, I've chosen to preach on today. There are three distinct sections, but they kind of all weave together, and uh, they all speak of an aspect of discipleship that I think is critical for us to know. If we don't know these things, you and I will not be able to follow Christ as deeply and as profoundly uh, and uh, and for the long haul as God wants us to. And so it's imperative that we understand what his message is for us in this passage today. So I'm going to ask us to stand as we... Read Matthew 8, 18 through 34. <clears throat> you could follow along as I read. Excuse me, I kind of got a frog in my throat too, so bear with me as I read. All right. It says this. When Jesus saw the crowd around him, <clears throat> he gave orders to cross to the other side of the lake. Then a teacher of the law came to him and said, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. 
And then the disciples said to him, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus told him, follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. <clears throat> then he got into the boat and his disciples followed him. Without warning, a furious storm came up on the lake so that the waves swept over the boat. But Jesus was sleeping. The disciples went and woke him, saying, Lord, save us. We're going to drown. He replied, you have little faith. Why are you so afraid? Then he got up and rebuked the winds and the waves, and it was completely calm. The men were amazed and asked, what kind of man is this? Even the winds and the waves obey him. When he arrived at the other side in the region of the Gadarenes, two demon-possessed men coming from the tombs met him. They were so violent that no one could pass that way. What do you want with us, son of God, they shouted. Have you come here to torture us before the appointed time? Some distance from them, a large herd of pigs was feeding. The demons begged Jesus, if you drive us out, send us into the herd of pigs. He said to them, go. So they came out and went into the pigs, and the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and died in the water. Those tending the pigs ran off, went into the town, and reported all this, including what had happened to the demon-possessed men. Then the whole town went out to meet Jesus, and when they saw him, they pleaded with him to leave their region. Okay, go ahead and have a seat. <coughs> Excuse me. I want to uh, talk about four different aspects of following Jesus that come from this passage. The first aspect is this list. And, and you know, in our church, we talk about growing passionate followers of Christ. So um, this is what it means for us to grow as passionate followers of Christ. A passionate follower of Christ is not just a part of the crowd. A passionate follower of Christ is not just a part of the crowd. Did you notice how it begins? How the, Jesus looks and he sees the crowd... And his response to the crowd is, he leaves the crowd. Now, that's very convicting, because I love crowds. I wish, this, I wish this room were filled to, to all the way back to that far wall, filled with people. But Jesus knows something about crowds. Jesus knows that in a crowd, there's always people who are just there because there's other people there. Jesus knows that in a crowd, you always have these uh, superficial people who are coming to see Jesus just because there's miracles happening, that uh, uh, lives are, are, are being healed. And that's a cool thing. There's a lot of excitement oftentimes when there's a crowd around. And yet Jesus sees the crowd and he moves away from the crowd. He says, let's go away from the crowd. Because the purpose that Jesus came for wasn't to gather a crowd of people. He wants the crowd of people to become committed people, to become passionate followers. Now, usually, we all begin in the crowd. Usually, we all begin somewhere, and that's with the crowd of people. There's an interest. We, we see other people being uh, interested in Jesus, excited about Jesus, and so we may come around, and we may want to hear what's going on. We hear that Jesus is doing something. We hear that people are being saved or touched or, or um, uh, healed, and we say, that's a great thing. But Jesus never wants us to remain in the crowd. He wants us to move from being in the crowd to being a committed follower of his. And in this passage, we see there's two different people in this first account, right? The first one <clears throat> kind of brashly, boldly, um, just kind of says, hey, Jesus, I'll follow you. But Jesus sees right through him. And it isn't as if Jesus doesn't want him to follow him, but he wants him to understand what it means to follow him. And so he says, you know, foxes have holes. And the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. He says, I don't even know where I'm going to be sleeping. Are you sure you want to follow me? Do you know what it means to follow me? Because there are always people in the crowd who think, yeah, I want to follow Jesus, but they're only wanting to follow because it's exciting and new and fresh and all that. But Jesus says, you know what? There is a price to pay. There is a cost to count. 
And that strikes at the core of us because it really starts to reveal then in us, why are we saying we want to follow Jesus? Are we willing to follow Jesus when it gets hard to follow Jesus? When it doesn't always seem to go our way? When there's a demand on our life? He says, count the cost. Don't have a superficial faith that says, yes, I'll do it, but we haven't thought through what it means to follow. The other man, and we know from Luke's gospel, Jesus actually asked the other man, hey, you follow me. The first guy was volunteered. The first guy volunteered says, hey, I'll follow you. And Jesus says this thing about not having any place to lay his head. And then Jesus sees another guy and says, hey, you follow me. And the guy says, well, I will. Just first let me bury my father. Now, um, in that day, uh, we know that his father hadn't died. It wasn't like his, de- his, his father was laying, like, in the home, a dead corpse, you know, waiting to be buried. Um, the custom of that day was to bury right away after someone died. If he had died, if his father had actually died, he wouldn't have even been around Jesus. He would have been taking care of his father and burying him. What the guy was saying is, probably, my dad is old. I want to hang around. Um, You know, he might die in a few months, maybe in a year or so. After that, I'm going to follow you, okay? And Jesus says this, let the dead bury their own dead, which is a great way of just saying, no, you follow me. Don't delay. Don't wait. Don't wait for when it's a convenient time. See, there are people who say, God, I'm going to get serious with you. I'm going to follow you when something else happens. Let me, let you know, life is crazy right now, God. I have young children. It's crazy. Let me get through this time where it's not so crazy, then I'll really get serious about you. We, you know, <clears throat> there, there's a way of saying no to God. We just, and, and it's a very creative way, we just say later. It's like the guy who um, is dating a gal for 20 years. And uh, she says, hey, are we ever going to get married? And he goes, yeah, we will. Come on, it's only been 20 years. You know, we want to make sure, right? And you kind of get the clue. Later means no. Don't wait. Don't wait till when it's convenient. Don't wait till, you know, you get through with the project at work. Don't wait till the kids are grown. Don't wait till the parents are, you know, you, you got them all situated. Don't wait. Jesus says, let the dead bear their own. You follow me. You know when the best time to follow Jesus is? The best time to follow Jesus is now. And we think, no, God, you understand. We, we kind of have a, this view of God that says, you know what? God's loving, he's gracious, he understands. Therefore, I could say wait and he'll be cool with it. And he's not cool with it. Now that doesn't mean he's not going to accept you later on, but you may forfeit a lot of things in the process. There may be things that you miss out on in the process that you can never recapture again by saying, wait. God wants us now. There's nothing better for us to do. Thank you very much. There is nothing better for us to do than to give ourselves to the Lord now. There's nothing more important, nothing worth putting uh, off the Lord. How are you following Jesus now? How are you becoming more and more of a follower of Jesus? How are you entering into the call to be a disciple now? Don't wait. A passionate follower of Christ dies to self. 
a passionate follower of Christ dies to self. Okay. It's good to know. <clears throat> when I um, got into, um, well, before I got into college, um, in high school, high school was pretty easy. Um, high school was a fun time in life. It was pretty easy. I got pretty good grades. In fact, I was in, believe it or not, I was in the top 10 in my school. No, I was not homeschooled. <laughs> Dwayne was in the top one. <laughs> but when I got to college, my, I got my butt kicked. That first year was tough. I didn't realize how hard it was. I didn't realize how much I needed to study and apply myself. And um, it was tough, you know. And my grades, you know, I was used to getting really good grades, and they just plummeted. I had no idea of what it would be like once I got into college. I thought it was going to be like high school, you know, just a little bit, just a little bit above high school, and it was a lot harder then. And I wish that I had known. I wish I had counted the costs. I wish someone would have told me. They probably did tell me. I just wasn't listening. I need to apply myself more. I was thinking about going into engineering, and I ended up being an accountant. Because uh, it was too tough. I wasn't ready for it. Couldn't handle it. There is, a, uh, there is a cost that God wants us to understand that we need to die to ourselves. We need to die to ourselves and say, you know what, Lord? It's not about my timing when it's convenient for me. It's about your calling. It's, it, it, it really isn't you know, uh, uh, about just the excitement of things. It doesn't, it's not just about when things are going well, I want to follow you. You're going to call me to do things that are really uncomfortable. And I need to know that. But I also need to understand you are so worth it. Yes, God calls us to count the cost, but he doesn't do that to discourage us from following him. He wants us to follow him. But he wants us to see the value of following him. And the blessings of following God, the blessings of, of, of choosing to yield ourselves to him and his will, they far surpass any cost that he's going to ask of us. But he does want us to understand it's not going to be according to our will. See, on one hand, um, that first guy, uh, he needed to die to his own understanding of what it meant to follow Jesus. The second guy, he needed to die to his, his uh, desire for control, doing things on his own timetable when he wanted We need to die to ourselves. Passion follower of Christ also has real <clears throat> and not theoretical faith. Has real but not and not theoretical faith. Um, as we move to that account where Jesus calms the storm, you know, I had read this passage many times, and what I noticed was what many of you notice. You know, Jesus goes into the boat, he's with his disciples. Jesus falls asleep, storm comes up, waves come over the side of the boat, and the disciples are afraid, they wake Jesus, he calms the storm, they're astonished. What I never noticed is that the disciples went to Jesus, and they said, save us. Now, think about that for a moment, okay? Okay. There's a storm raging. Jesus is in the boat sleeping. What is he supposed to do? Right? Were they hoping that he would help them bail water out? No. They came to him, and they said, save us. They really believed that he could save them. 
But when he actually did save them, they're shocked out of their mind. They, 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 they had this theoretical belief that Jesus could do something, and then they're shocked out of their mind when he actually does it. And I think that <clears throat> what it reveals is that you and I, we could live in this theoretical state of God could do anything, but we don't really live like he will do anything. We could live in this theoretical state that, you know, if you ask us, can God, you know, can God save people through me? Can God use me? We say, yeah, he could use anybody, theoretically. But then we go out and we don't live as if he will use us. And God wants to move us from just this theoretical belief that God could do something, and he wants us to live in the reality that he is going to, that God is an awesome God, and he's going to work through us, and he's going to bring salvation to people around us. He's going to bring salvation to Japan, to Indochina. He's going to use us. But that theoretical faith needs to start to um, move into this realm of we then begin to walk in the reality of that. See, because it's real easy to say, yeah, I believe that God could do that and never lift a finger and never move toward it. And it takes on a whole new dimension when we say, yeah, I believe God is doing that and here I am, send me. Here I am. I believe it. I'm trusting. I'm going to go for it. Right? When um, Jamson and Joel just shared, <clears throat> they said that they, you know, they started moving their stuff. We took, um, I don't know, three suitcases full of their stuff to Japan. They're starting to get their stuff over there. They didn't, have any, they didn't even have permission yet or approval yet from their from their boss, the final approval. It still had to be okayed. They were going on faith. They were believing God had called them to go and he was going to make a way. And so just like the Israelites were called to step into the Jordan River before it would part, they stepped into the destiny that God has for them and watched God part the sea. They watch God give that approval for them to go. That's not theoretical faith. That's a real faith. A faith of action. How is God moving in your life? What does he want you to step into in a real way? Not just saying words that I believe God can do anything, but move into that realm that says God is working and I'm going to step into what God is doing. And I'm going to believe that God is going to do something through me. When I was reading uh, in my devotional time, I noticed how God had called the Israelites to go into the land, the promised land. <clears throat> and he had promised them that he was going to fight their battles for them. He was going to fight for them. And when you have God fighting for you, there is no doubt that there is going to be victory. But he did say this, do not fear. And the reason why he said do not fear is the one thing that could thwart the victory would be if the people feared and shrank away and didn't enter into the promises that God had given them. And that's exactly what happened. They shrank away in fear. And so they forfeited the victory that God had already ordained for them. Because God said he was going to give them the victory. He was going to give them the land. And he was going to fight the battle. But they shrank away in fear. There is a faith, a realness of faith that says, I believe God and I'm going to move forward into it. And God doesn't tell us everything that's going to happen all the time right in up front. He just says, 
I am with you always to the very end of the age. I am with you. I won't leave you. I won't turn my back on you. I'm going to be with you. And if God says to us, go and make disciples of all nations, he's going to be with us. And if he tells us to go and make disciples, I think we should expect that disciples will be made. I think there should be a level of faith that says, you know what? God has called us to do something. He's empowered us to do it. Therefore, I'm going to step into that and begin to activate my faith and watch God work. A passionate follower of Christ has a real faith, not a theoretical one. Lastly, in this uh, last um, section that we read, we see a passionate follower of Christ chooses a kingdom life over a quiet life. Passion follows Christ, choose a kingdom life over a quiet life. The, um, the encounter, the encounter with these two demon-possessed men <coughs> is an amazing encounter of God's power, God's kingdom reign coming to bear on these two, uh, two poor men who have been racked and, uh, and possessed and oppressed by these demons. They become a spectacle to, the, um, to that townspeople. It tells us in other passages that they've been put in chains. And the chains couldn't even hold them. They live amongst the tombs naked. I mean, talk about a freak show, right? These guys are, are, are out of control, suffering, and Jesus comes to them and he brings the kingdom of God to bear in their lives. And there's a deliverance. And uh, <clears throat> he, he, you know, there's this herd of pigs, right? And the demons get sent to the pigs. The pigs go into the water. They drown. And the people who own the pigs, they're looking and, and they're seeing what's going on here. They go to the townspeople, tell them everything that happened. I like the way it says, they told them everything that happened, including... What happened to the demon-possessed men? When I read that, it, makes, it, it tells me that the emphasis is on what happened to the pigs. The emphasis is on, we just lost our herd. The townspeople come, and they say one of the saddest things in all of Scripture. The Son of God has come into their region, and they tell him, they plead with him, they beg him, would you please go away? Would you just please leave? See, we care more about the pigs. And at least with the pigs, you know, and even with these demon-possessed men, yeah, they're kind of a little strange, but I think we got that under control, and we kind of know about them, but we just want to lead a quiet life. We just want to have things be normal. As strange and as, as dysfunctional as it is, we just like you know, just to be quiet and, 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 and have this, this calm life. And, and we would rather have that than you coming in and upsetting things. And I think for people of God, we make the decision, we would rather have the kingdom life than this sort of quiet life. You start entering into the kingdom life and who knows where God's going to lead you. Who knows what God's going to ask you to do, right? Who knows where he's going to call you to go? Who knows what he's going to call you to say? Because um, God does things and sometimes it just, it, it, it is crazy. Right? I was laughing because when Janice and Joel said they're going to go to Japan, I thought, yeah, that makes some sense. Because, you know, Jan you know Joel, he's, he's Chinese-American. Uh, Janice is Korean-American. And they're going to Japan. It makes perfect sense, right? 
Joel's never been a pastor. He hasn't gone to seminary. That makes perfect sense. Right? We have Yachio in Cambodia, whose first language is English, I mean, Japanese, and she's teaching English. That makes perfect sense in God's kingdom. We have Jason, a math teacher, going to Vietnam to teach English because that makes sense in the kingdom. When God asked us to start the church, I never finished seminary. I took seminary classes, never finished the degree, and he, God called me to plant this church with a few other people, and now he's having us teach. We've taught in four different countries. That doesn't make sense from a human standpoint. But in God's economy, it does. We don't know what he's going to ask you to do, where he's going to ask you to go. But I tell you, it's going to kind of change your life. You know what I mean? Following God has a way of, of just turning over the apple carts of our life. And, and um, if, you're, if you're looking for the quiet life, I got news for you. God wants something far deeper and richer and more exciting and more adventurous for you than just sort of quietly going through life. He wants to use you in amazing ways. He wants to, he, he, for most of us here, he sent you into dark places. Many of you are in very, very, you are working in very dark places. And you're like this only, you're, you're like one of the few candles in this dark place. And God has sent you to bring his light and love into that dark place. And it's important for you to realize he sent you there so that you could then make a difference. That you could actually be the salt of the world. That you could make a difference in that place. It's not so that you could sort of mind your own business and not upset what's going on there and sort of go with the flow. He's called you into kingdom work. It's a wonderful privilege for us to be involved in his kingdom work. And it doesn't matter if it's at your place of business or in your neighborhood. It doesn't matter if it's in your family. You are called to go and make disciples of all nations. It's amazing. It's wonderful. It's the life that God has for us. The question I want to leave you with, what does it look like for you to be a follower? Are you, are you approaching this thing and saying, God, I want you on my terms? Or are you just saying, God, take me. Take me and use me. And I'm yours. And I'm willing to do whatever you want me to do. Do you have qualifications around that? Or does he have your heart? And maybe you, you, you just have to cry out to him and say, God, honestly, I'm a slave. Help me. Like that man who said, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. You just cry out to him and ask him, ask him to help you to take the next step with the kingdom. Where are you when it comes to following Christ and being part of his great kingdom? Part of your discipleship is you're going to walk in a very special way with the Lord. Maybe you're going to sort of stop and say, you know what, I want to be a man. 